we're going to be continuing our series in Thrive, looking at the book of Daniel. There is more that we can possibly cover in any one sermon when we're dealing with scripture. And I encourage you to read through the book of Daniel uh, this week, tomorrow, if you have time off, uh, read through it. At, at least read through chapter three so you get to see the larger context. A lot of lessons, a lot of principles. This morning I'm gonna be developing Daniel three, particularly along the line of faith that John was just singing about here. So as we, uh, as we do that, this projector is not on. As, as we look at this, there will be some things that we're going to be talking about and, and looking at that are going to be critical. Uh, I want to recognize uh, Dr. Um, Brian Chapel and others for the work on today's message. Um, a lot of resources go in, including conversations. And if you ever have any question on any part of a sermon, come to me and talk. I'd love to talk about the Bible love to talk about uh, the biblical text and uh, why I develop it the way that I do. So don't hesitate to come up and talk with me. And as we look today, we're gonna to be focusing on, on uh, the biblical text as we look at Daniel chapter three. We'll be reading that in just a moment. Um, the sermon title that I have, uh, as you look at your sermon notes, you will see uh, faith in the fire, but you can't read it. And when I saw that printed out, I thought the text isn't going to, that, that isn't going to work. Uh, and um, uh, I, I have new ones that you'll see. Friday, July 2nd, uh, this dear woman, that's me in the picture on the, on the left side if you don't recognize me. Uh, 39 years ago, Friday, Debbie and I said our I do's to one another. And 39 years ago, I don't think either of us realized the trials and the joys that would, would uh, be coming before us. Uh, three kids, nine grandkids, uh, ministry that has literally taken me around the world uh, multiple times every year for a decade, and um, just a, a great opportunity. Debbie is out in California right now celebrating a family wedding with, uh, with her family. So as we, as we move through the next slide, Thrive, and the next slide, uh, Fire, uh, we are coming to the intro for the message. And it has been popular in the last couple of years to see a bumper sticker or a sign in stores or even in people's homes where it is just simply the word believe. Just simply the word believe. And as we look at this, you know, there is a growing consensus in our popular culture that good things come to us if we just have enough confidence in the outcome. In other words, it's that idea that, that we can create our own reality, and that is not a biblical thought. There are people out there who think in order to get a good job, in order to get a handsome boyfriend or a great looking girlfriend or a spouse uh, or a trip to Hollywood on American Idol, all you have to do is really, really, really believe. And you get the results that you want. Unfortunately, that idea can make really good things, that we can make really good things happen uh, by the adequacy of our faith gets to get so much play in our culture that people actually begin to believe it. The idea that, that a adequate faith can trigger God into giving us the best things in life right now gets transferred into the more, most serious situations in our life, in our jobs, in our families, in our faith. Even Bible-believing Christians begin to assume that they can make really good things happen by exercising exceptional faith. And there are some churches that even teach that. But it's not biblical. It's not biblical. Jesus tells us that difficulty invades every life, including that of the faithful. 
We can't, we can't gauge the, the adequacy of our faith by the absence of trials. We need to define faith by, by standards other than popular, uh, popular thought. And this morning we're going to be looking at three giants of the faith, three men who are biblical heroes, Meshach, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Or if you go um, Shadrach, Abednego, Meshach, you have Sam, if you just want to shorten it up. But I'll stick with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And, and we're going to look at their faith. In Hebrews 11, it says that through faith they quenched the power of fire. With great courage, they expressed their faith in refusing to bow down to the image that Nebuchadnezzar had created in, in this um, uh, statue that, that he had made of gold. Yet when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, their obedience put them on the brink of, of this fiery furnace, they didn't pretend to know what the outcome was going to be. They didn't know if they were going to live or die. They probably assumed that they were going to die. Even though they affirmed that God was able to deliver them, they added in verse 18, but even if he does not, we want you to know your majesty, we will not serve your gods. Whole lot that could be developed there. Uh, another series we could develop on, on idolatry. The actions of these men didn't operate on popular opinion. Their faith isn't an exceptional faith, but rather their faith points us not to particular outcomes, but it points us to the object of their faith, who is God. By their words and actions, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego tell us more about a biblical faith. A biblical faith isn't, isn't confidence in a particular outcome. It is confidence in the eternal God that they served and that we are called to serve. A God who vindicates his power in this passage when these men choose burning rather than turning their backs on him. Uh, we trust that God knows what we can't discern. God's plans that we can't anticipate. God's understanding of life and the world that we can't begin to understand. Faith isn't our confidence in belief, it is confidence in God. Any other perspective is ultimately going to do us harm, and it will harm others. Daniel 3 isn't about the quantity or the quality of faith that we see emphasized in our culture, but rather it is about the object of our faith, Jesus Christ. Faith is trusts God in great trials regardless of the consequences. That's the big idea here. If you remember nothing else, remember this. Faith trusts God in the great trials regardless of outcome. So this morning I want to share from Daniel 3, reading verses 16 um, through verse 20, um, 26. Uh, and in honor of God's word, let's stand as I read this for us this morning. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. The Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude towards them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to throw them into the blazing fire. So these men, wearing their robes, their trousers, their turbans, their other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent that the furnace, and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, tied firmly, or firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? 
And they replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like the son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servant of the most high God, come out, come here. Thank you. Please be seated. These men had faith in God. And faith trusts God in great trial regardless of the outcome. One way to get a better picture of this biblical faith, the kind of faith that, uh, that helps rather than harms, is, is to examine the kind of faith these men shared. Their faith will first give us a clear understanding of what biblical faith isn't. And, and I want us to focus for just a couple of minutes on what biblical faith is not, but of what our culture says faith is, or what belief is. So faith isn't a trust in the quantity of belief. In the quantity of belief. We may be tempted to measure our faith by how much confidence we can pump into our minds, how much we can squeeze out of our hearts uh, so so that what we want to happen will occur. We may sing a spiritual song, pray long, study the Bible a lot, scold ourselves for questioning thoughts in order to fill our minds with as much belief as necessary to get God to do what we want him to do. To get God to do what we think best. In one sense, we're like athletes who are trying to pump themselves up uh, in, uh, for a big event, convincing ourselves that if we really, really believe that, that uh, uh, well, if we really, really believe, we'll accomplish our goal. Brian Chappell says, uh, in another sense, we resemble witches throwing in a pinch of song, an ounce of prayer, a ton of belief into the cauldron of human desires so that God must do what we determine he should. Our faith isn't so much in God as it is in the amount of belief that we have conjured to control him. Have you ever thought, if only I had a little more faith, then... If I had a little more faith, God would do what I wanted him to do. God would answer the prayer the way I want him to answer it. But that ultimately is is a trap of defining faith as, as a confidence in our quantity of belief rather than our confidence in God. It is God who saved these men, not their faith. When something unwanted occurred, Uh, we often look and we assume that either our faith in God is inadequate or God himself is inadequate. And we maybe read the Bible enough to know that God is not the issue, so we think our faith is at fault. Faith isn't trusting how much confidence we have about the things that we would like to happen. The words of these three men remind us that faith isn't measured by the expectations we have or by the strength of conviction. We need to understand that whatever my God ordains is right. Biblical faith calls each of us to acknowledge that God's provision is sufficient. Loving and good. Faith understands and looks at God and his response, though we may not understand it, and though it may fall short of our own personal expectations and desires. Believers believers whose faith will understand or withstand the trials of this world, world must be able to affirm that I might not understand God's provision. I might not know what God is going to do or what the outcome is going to be. But biblical faith is that my God knows best, not what I think is best. Faith means that we trust God's wisdom more than our own. 
that we depend on God. Faith means we trust God's wisdom. We insist that true faith, if we insist that true faith untangles problems and removes afflictions and difficulties in life, then, then what we're doing is setting ourselves up for a, a perpetual emotional high. And if we don't maintain that, we run into difficulties. Faith in Jesus Christ isn't a feeling. Feelings change, our faith should not. The object of our faith does not. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego believed in God's presence and care because they had witnessed that in their own life and they knew the history of their uh, people. Uh, despite the likelihood that, that Nebuchadnezzar is going to burn them alive, they are taking a firm stand for God. They understood that, that God was near them. They understood that if they perished in the fire, God was still near them. They trusted God because time after time, God had shown himself faithful to their forefathers by delivering them from their enemies, even when the nation sinned. Even when they did, even when they abandoned God, he still did not abandon them. Faith wasn't shattered because it wasn't rooted in their present circumstances. Their faith was rooted in the nature of God. A, a God whose purposes are loving and eternal can be trusted. Tragedy doesn't mean that God has vanished. Difficulty doesn't mean uh, that, that uh, there is a failure in God. Danger doesn't indicate that God isn't present. Uh, Difficulty doesn't imply that he is weak. God is in control, even when we think he might not be. Difficulties can still arise, but he enables us to prevail. Grief may still come. You will lose maybe a partner in life the way uh, Carol lost Cal. But we recognize God gives us strength to bear it. We grieve, but God helps us through that. True faith simply acknowledge that God knows what to do and we don't. God does what is right. We live in a fallen world where illness and injury and difficulty and tragedy are all going to thrive until the day that Jesus returns to this earth. We live in a fallen world. As followers of Jesus Christ, we aren't immune to the consequences of living in a broken world. There are times when it just might seem that life drops out from underneath us. Teaching that some heroic degree of faith will somehow inoculate us from the trial and tragedy destroys the faith that we actually need in the face of difficulty and affliction. We need to understand the biblical teaching on suffering and have a comprehensive view of how God wants us to live our life. Of course God can remove disease. Of course God can deal with difficulty and take it out of our lives. But he may also, understand, he may also desire to use your witness in the midst of that difficulty for some eternal purpose that we can't begin to comprehend. So I'm always torn when, when a person you know, asks for prayer concerning an illness of their loved one. Yes, on one level, I wanna pray for the healing of that person, but on, on another level, I wanna pray that, that the suffering that they go through isn't lost that the lessons are learned, that, that people will learn more about Christ through the tragedy, because more often than not, people see God at work in the tragedies of their life than in the blessings of their life. The choice is his. Our job is to trust him. Real faith isn't faith in the quantity of our confidence, it is faith in God. So we understand biblical faith is not about the quantity of our faith, nor is it about the quality of our faith. Um, quantity of belief doesn't get us what we want. Another error is that, that God's will 
uh, to do as we desire, if our des- that God will do what we desire if our desire is spiritually strong or spiritually good enough, at least from our perspective. We, we trust that God will fulfill our desires because the quality of our belief. We expect God to do what we want because we determine, uh, we beter- we determine that it is in God's best interests to make this happen. After all, this is for God's sake. We want God to be honored, God to be praised. So we become convinced that what we want has to happen. Biblical faith should keep us from being so attached that, we, that what we think is right, even if we are convinced that what we want is for God's good. Biblical faith should keep us from thinking that God has failed because he doesn't follow through and achieve the outcomes that we wanted. Faith is trust in God and his plan. Faith doesn't require God to fulfill the wishes as though our desires were his command and our human plans divine decrees. God knows what is necessary, uh, what is necessary to bring others to himself. We don't. God knows how to how to deal with the realities of this world. We don't. Faith doesn't require God to make happen what we want, even if we're doing it for the right reasons. Learning to trust God's wisdom above our own isn't an easy lesson. In in times of trouble, relying on God's wisdom uh, can try the faith of the most spiritually mature. Christian counselor, and author Jim Conway shares a story from his life uh, about a struggle to trust God's wisdom in the situation his daughter Becky was involved in. Becky had been diagnosed with cancer and the doctors said her leg needed to be amputated in order to save her life. So Jim knew that uh, that God could bring healing into Becky's life. He knew he had the ability to to deal with that. So Jim and his family began to pray that God would heal Becky, that the surgery would not be necessary. And and they prayed that God would be honored and and magnified and worshiped if, if he removed all cancer from Becky's life. Maybe you've been in a situation praying for a family member that is struggling with a serious health issue. So strongly did the family believe that God would heal Becky that on the day of surgery, Jim insisted that the surgeon re-examine her leg before surgery just to make sure that the cancer hadn't gone. And the surgeon agreed and the family went into the waiting room and and while their members of of the uh, church came and uh, they were waiting with Jim uh, to see what would happen. And Jim later wrote, he said, a crowd of friends from the church came to wait with us. So many came that they made us leave the waiting room. And and when the surgeon came out, I knew from the look on his face what he was going to say, and I couldn't face it. I couldn't face all of my friends. I ran. I, I ran to the hospital basement where no one could find me. I cried, I yelled, I pounded my fists against the wall in anger. How could the God I served abandon me at the hour of my greatest need? Was he so busy answering the prayers of finding parking spaces for people that he couldn't see Becky? That doubt That question, that experience devastated Jim, but it also drove him back to the word of God. And he started to study the Bible about about, uh, prayer. He started to study the Bible about faith, and he discovered the problem with a faith that blindly insists that that we should that we should, that what we want even if it's to see God, isn't the outcome, isn't the focus. He discovered that that kind of faith is really foreign in the Bible. And we have to make sure that we don't let the aching of our heart and our soul, uh, that that desire 
uh, blind us and help us lose sight, make us lose sight of what God's word so plainly teaches. We can't forget the faith of the men and the women of the Bible who didn't have everything go their way. If we forget them, we will define faith in such a way that others get hurt in addition to us. The Bible records at least four examples out of Paul's life where he suffered illness or tragedy and God did not intervene. Paul suffered physically, but Paul was also able to record the words of God in 2 Corinthians 12 where where God is saying, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul understood that biblical faith doesn't remove the obstacles of life, the challenges that we have to deal with. He knew, though, that he could trust God. The most powerful testimony that we Christians have isn't that we live on easy street, but rather that God walks with us. He takes care of us. He loves us in the midst of tragedy. So we see... uh, we, we see trouble, but we know that God strengthens us to go through that. We understand that our plans, our wisdoms, and our desires can be wrong. Hebrews 11 shows us a list of faithful believers who suffered great hardships, who had been tortured, who had been flogged, imprisoned, stoned, pierced with swords, sawed in two, made destitute, deprived, homeless, all commended for their faith. Because their faith in God had led to those actions, just as the faith of these three men led them to be thrown into that fire. The writer of Hebrews makes it clear that those who are most spiritual and faithful may not have their earthly desires fulfilled. The Bible doesn't say the presence of difficulty, though, is the absence of faith. Look at Jesus. He prayed before his crucifixion. And look at what he prayed. He he said, Father, if it is possible, remove this cup from me. And then he went into his greatest desire, yet not my will, but your will be done. He understood his faith was in God's plans, not in the absence of pain in his own life. Even if that perfect plan of the Father meant his personal humiliation and torture, real faith trusts God's plan. It trusts God's purpose. We don't trust in what we decide is right. We trust that God knows and will do what is right in his time, according to his will, to accomplish his gracious purposes throughout eternity. By their example, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego can help us understand how to, uh, well, they present a simple plan of action for helping us faithfully confront the trials that are part of our life we first of all need to acknowledge that our needs without, what our needs are without stipulating how God needs to respond, how God should respond. Uh, we, we don't tell God what to do. Second, we humbly acknowledge the ability of God to either meet our needs in the way that we desire or to understand that he knows better. God is able to do the best. And finally, we commit ourselves to the uncompromising obedience that comes. We will not bow down and worship your gods. As they say this, they're doing so in a respectful way, but they are firmly taking a stand for God at this point. We trust and obey that God will take care of the circumstances, whatever they are. Now in that fire, Nebuchadnezzar saw not three but four 
individuals. We understand the pre-incarnate Christ. There are times in the Old Testament when God the Father manifests himself in human form. We call that a theophany. There are times when, when Jesus manifests himself, the Godhead manifests itself in the person of Jesus, and we call that a Christophany. And this, what is happening in chapter three, is what we refer to as a pre-incarnate Christ. A, a, a presence of Christ, that Christ appeared before, uh, before he was born. And we understand that Christ was with them in the midst of all of that. And, and whether they had lived or died, they didn't know how God was going to respond. So we have seen that faith isn't the quantity or the quality of belief. So we look now at what biblical belief is. And we understand that biblical faith is believing that God is able. The first reason we trust God is that we believe he is able to do more abundantly than all that we think or ask. One of my favorite prayers out of Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. God is able to do more than we think or ask. And, and that was certainly the experience of these three men. They were just blown away, I am sure, that, that God preserved their lives. They didn't even smell like smoke. Their clothes unmarked by the, by the uh, uh, fire. Shadrach, and Mesh Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I get excited and go too fast, my mouth doesn't keep up with my brain. Uh, they echo this certainty, we serve a God who is able to deliver us. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand, verse 17. They had good reason for this affirmation. They had the testimony of God's supernatural, super powerful work in the past. They had the witness of their forefathers that had been preserved by the power of this covenant-keeping God. Read your Bibles and see how, how God miraculously delivers his people time after time as you read through the book of Judges and other passages of scripture. Familiarize yourself with how God uses ordinary people to accomplish and achieve extraordinary things. Through the power, uh, through all of these scriptural accounts, we have evidence of the power of God and what he is able to do. And what he is capable of doing is more beyond our imagination. But we know whatever he does, he knows what is best. Thus, biblical faith affirms that God has the power to rescue, that God can rescue, but that is, en that is not enough reason to trust him. Because if he can rescue, but he would be undependable or unkind or untrustworthy, then that is not a God that you would want to put your faith in. So we believe that God is able, but we also believe, based on Scripture and the character of God, that God is good. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego affirm the goodness of God. They they remove any doubt as to the outcome of their circumstances. They add that statement in, in verse 18, but even if he does not save us, it is a clear refusal on their part to predict the outcome of their circumstance. They're anticipating death as they take their stand for God and refuse to worship and bow down before the idol. Uh, they knew God's goodness in the history of his people. They had experienced God's goodness in the issue concerning the food in chapter one. They had seen God miraculously give Daniel the dream and the interpretation that saved their lives in chapter two. And uh, now they trust God's provision, not because their circumstances are always good, but because they recognize that God is. God is good, even when our circumstances stink. God entered our lives in the dust and the dirt of a cattle stall, of an animal stall. He gave his life on a cross made filthy by the guilt of your sin and mine. 
When we aren't certain what, what the best turn of events might be, we can still rest in the love of God. When we aren't certain and are unable to predict how God is going to handle things, we can still rest in his love. Because this holy God is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-wise, he has shown us how much he cares for us through the cross of Jesus Christ. So we look and we understand that faith rests in his love even when our mind can't, can't search out his reasons. We trust because though, well, we trust because of the Son, Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ, God has shown us how much he loves us. And our faith can rest in Christ and in his love. A pastor in a rural church um, he ministered to hardworking farmers and miners, and he learned a story that helped him understand the foundation of biblical faith. There, there was a miner who was a strong believer. As a young man, there was an accident at the mine that left him a quadriplegic for the rest of his life. It was actually more than just, uh, well, uh, it left him bedridden, unable to work. Over the years, he would look out his bedroom window and he'd see the guys that he grew up with uh, going about their lives, getting successful, getting married, having kids, having grandkids, all the things that he never would have. Um, he watched and didn't share in any of the rewards or joys that they had. Uh, then one day, this bedridden miner, now an old man, had a visitor come to his house, and it was a young man who said, I hear that you believe in a God who loves you. How could you possibly believe in a God like that, given your circumstances? And the man thought for a moment, and then he smiled, and he said, yeah, it's true. Sometimes Satan comes into this torn-down house of mine, and uh, worn out, worn down, and he sits where you're sitting, and he starts challenging me. He, he points out the window to, with, to a man I once to work with, uh, who is, all these men are still strong and active. And Satan asks, does Jesus really love you? And then he will point to a uh, the room that I live in, and, and a house I haven't been able to maintain, and he'll say, does Jesus really love you? And then at last, Satan points at a grandchild of a man walking by, a man who has everything that I never would have. And he says, does Jesus really love you? The young man looked at the old miner and said, well, what do you say in that circumstance when that happens? The old miner said, well, I take Satan by the hand and I lead him in my mind to a hill far away called Calvary. And there I point to the thorn-scarred brow that is bleeding, to the hands and the feet that have been pierced by spikes, to, to the side that, that has had a spear thrust through it. And I ask Satan, does God really love me? The cross is our reason for confidence. Despite the lifelong heartache that we might have. Had any of us stood at the cross the day that Jesus was, was hanging there and we saw the horror, we would cry out to God to stop it. Stop all of this. Bring Jesus down from the cross. He doesn't deserve it. And yet God waited until the life drained from the one and only unique begotten Son of the Father. Looking at privilege, not offspring. We understand that the agony of Jesus didn't mean that the Father had failed. His death on the cross didn't mean Jesus' faith was weak. There was great suffering, but in those sufferings, there was purpose so loving, so 
powerful, so good that my eternity has been changed forever and your eternity can be changed forever through faith in Jesus Christ. And if you've never experienced that life-saving, life-changing faith, talk with me or talk with one of the elders before you leave this building this morning. It is only through that that our sins have been that our sins can be washed away because of what Christ has done for us. When our focus remains on the cross, our faith won't waver. Though, though troubles come, though human answers fail, our faith remains strong, just as these men's faith remains strong. Such faith doesn't demand doesn't depend on emotional intensity, on knowing what should happen, or on the certainty of what God will do. True biblical faith acknowledges that God knows what he is doing, that he does what is right because he loves us. We understand biblical trust, or faith trusts God in great trials regardless of the outcome. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that we are able to come into your presence, that we are able to learn just one out of many lessons from Daniel chapter three. The strongest promise, as I understand it in the, the New Testament, is that you will never leave us or forsake us. And there are times that we walk through life and we say, God, where are you? And we're reminded of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And though they didn't plan on it, you walked with them through the fire, just as you are with us in the trials that we face in our life. So Father, like these men, help us to have a biblical faith, a faith that is founded in a solid object, the immutable, ever-present, greatest that could ever be our Savior, Jesus Christ. So Father, we thank you for the lessons of faith that we can learn, that we can apply. Father, in the midst of our troubles, there will be people who are gifted to come alongside of us because they have experienced the same trials or similar trials that we are going through, and they minister to us. And, and we stand in the midst of our struggles as a witness to the world, and people see that even though we don't know. And it's not just a slight answer that, well, God is with me, but it is the earth, it is solid, God, that you are with us. And people hear it in our voice, they see it in our eyes, they hear it in our cry, they, they see it, Father. So Father, help us to live obedient to you, help us to trust you, help us to know that you are able, help us, Father, to remember that you are good. Work in us, Father, we pray in Christ's name, amen.